Interactive fiction, also known as text adventures or just IF, has an odd place in today's game landscape. Its earliest works, such as 1980's Zork by Mark Blank and Dave Lebling, are fondly remembered, even venerated as classics by game culture. Its command syntax, go west, get lamp, are familiar to modern gamers in the same way Fritz Lang movies might be familiar to modern film buffs. During the very first years of the PC revolution, circa 1980, text adventures, which were sold in stores in, uh, in boxes like these, uh, dominated the computer entertainment market. Also like silent movies, text games are usually seen as primitive forebearers of modern works. Many recent adventure games, such as Dan Marshall and Ben Ward's Time Gentlemen, Please, feature comical tributes to text adventures, invariably portraying them as ancient and frustrating. Jared Sorensen's tabletop role-playing game, Action Castle, specifically instructs its game master to act like a badly programmed and inflexible text game parser of yore. Winding Path. Exits are south, east, and up. Go to drawbridge. You don't see a drawbridge here. <laughs> east. Drawbridge! Faced with all this loving but self-assured sarcasm, a modern gamer might be surprised to learn that interactive fiction has continued to develop in all the years since its commercial heyday. Since 1995, the Interactive Fiction Competition, also known as the IF Comp, has served as this medium's heartbeat, pumping several dozen new games into the world every year. The comp puts no restrictions on entries' plot or style, so it's often a rich and fertile ground for experimentation. For example, 2007's Lost Pig by Admiral Hota puts the player into the boots of Grunk, an orc farmhand searching for the titular porker that has vanished from its pen. Get the pig. Grunk, walk right up to pig. Pig, walk right away from Grunk. Chase the pig. Pig, run away. So Grunk, run after pig. Then pig, run around behind Grunk and around front of Grunk and Grunk, get dizzy. What Grunk doing again? Jeremy Friese's Violet won the 2008 comp. Here, the protagonist is a grad student, and the game's narrator is the internalized voice of their girlfriend, who has threatened to fly back to Sydney if they don't get started writing their dissertation. Unplug the cable. You unplug the Ethernet cable. Good. It has to be easier to write if you can't chat, check email, or surf the web whenever you want. Write the dissertation. You resume thinking about the first sentence. You fidget. Your hands tremble a bit. You want to check your email. You want to read the blogs. And then you retrieve the cable and plug it back into the computer. Ugh, I didn't know it was this bad, Laura Keat. I don't know what to say. The IF Comp isn't the only source of new text adventures. Uh, 2009 alone saw the release of several new games during the off-season, including John Ingold's hard-boiled detective tale Make It Good, Jimmy Marr's Lovecraftian role-playing adaptation The King of Shreds and Patches, and Aaron Reed's pan-dimensional fantasy Blue Lacuna, perhaps the largest pure text work of interactive fiction ever written. So why has IF remained so obscure for so long? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Right up until around 2010, playing an IF game meant not just locating and downloading its game file, but also locating and downloading a separate program called an interpreter. Lacking that will give you error messages or garbage. Some games, like Blue Lacuna, feature rich websites with friendly download screens that help ease the pain of this process. An alternate solution comes by way of parchment. Created by Atul Varma, it allows works of interactive fiction to run in a web browser. While the Parchment website itself contains links to over 500 playable works, other projects have been adapting this technology for themselves. Andrew Plotkin, author of modern classics such as Shade and Spider and Web, recently used a customized version of Parchment to publish all his own works onto his website. One of the problems with interactive fiction and historically is that people have to download a game and then they have to download an interpreter or they have to make the interpreter work with the game. It's not terribly complicated, but any amount of friction is uh, it's a lot of friction for today's casual gamer. So I figure if there's a website where you go and the game is right there in front of you, that will uh, be a, a little bit more attractive proposition. The other problem is much less easy to address with a technological fix, involving something woven much deeper into the fabric of the medium. Namely, it's hard for a brand new player to figure out how to begin. Instead of giving the player an on-screen character who responds immediately and obviously to controller input, an IF game offers you this thing. 
the command prompt, something that for all of IF's advances hasn't changed a bit since 1980. IF author Emily Short has called the prompt a false promise, what with its implications that a player can type in anything they wish and the computer will somehow understand them. But typing freely can lead to unhelpful and confusing responses, and even the sense that playing means somehow guessing which words the machine wants you to type next. The problem lay in the fact that, because of its free text input, an IF game can't easily teach a new player about the form's conventions. But they do exist. IF works vary in the verbs they understand, but nearly all adhere to a more or less standard subset of basic player actions. This list is small enough to fit on this postcard-sized player aid designed by Lea Alba and Andrew Plotkin, which you can find on the web. To see some of these verbs in action, let's look at a game by Emily Short called Bronze. It's a retelling of the Beauty and the Beast fable with the player in the role of the heroine. At the start of any IF work, it's a good idea to take stock and look around. You can check what your character is holding with the inventory command, which also has an abbreviation, I. You are carrying nothing. The verb for examining objects is examine. One prominent feature described in this area is that gate. Because examine is such a common input verb, by the way, it has an abbreviation as well, X. The gate is closed. I guess we could try opening it? You shouldn't be able to open it, heavy as it is, but it swings aside lightly at your touch. The beast said that it knows friend from enemy, and the castle, at least, still regards you as friend. So now the path is clear, and we can use the verb go to actually go somewhere. The exit is to the north, so let's go there. And so we find ourselves in a new area, with many new directions to explore. For now, let's use compass abbreviations to scoot over to another room which happens to contain an object we can pick up. On the windowsill, a helmet waits, for use of the sentry. And pick up the helmet. You acquire the helmet, and assess it curiously. Lines of writing arc over each ear but you do not know the language in question. Well, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? Now we could try wear the helmet or read the writing, but I'll let you discover that yourself. On that note, I asked Nick Montfort, associate professor of digital media at MIT and author of Twisty Little Passages, a book about IF, for his thoughts on interactive fiction works more appropriate for new players. Well, there's a bunch of good games that uh, have novice modes uh, or otherwise provide instructions for people who are just starting off. Um, some of these would include Andrew Plotkin's Dreamhold, um, Emily Short's Bronze, and uh, Aaron Reed's Blue Lacuna. These can be very handy to uh, clue you in to the types of verbs that you might want to use, things you might want to attend to. But one of the things that uh, I like to do when uh, I, get, I have the chance to introduce a newcomer to interactive fiction is um, uh, pick a game that is um, sort of difficult, abstruse, um, even terrifying in a particular way. Uh, because I think that gives people the opportunity to understand um, how interactive fiction can be a very complex uh, but also very satisfying system. Two games that would be good examples of this would be Adam Cadre's Varicella and Dan Shiovitz's Bad Machine. Uh, Varicella is a sort of palace intrigue. You have a, a very deplorable character who goes around trying to become regent of uh, what turns out to be a science fictional uh, type of palace setting. Uh, there are many machinations, a uh, huge number of possible ways to uh, get uh, eviscerated and otherwise killed. Miss Sierra rolls her eyes, picks up her gun, and shoots you in the <laughs> catastrophic respiratory failure. And the booby trap's detonator deems it safe to explode. And total paralysis. You don't actually die until the fourth shot. You have died. How unseemly. And then uh, Dan Chovitz's Bad Machine is actually um, intriguing along this other dimension because uh, it doesn't even really look like the English language when you start it up. It's full of uh, uh, strange uh, pieces of code. You take the part of this uh, robot that has become broken um, and uh, the particular failure mode is that you've attained consciousness and you can move around in this uh, uh, bizarre factory world. In both of these cases, you can, you can see that there's something really interesting going on even if you're not going to um, be able to win very quickly, it shows you um, this really profound system that might motivate you to, uh, to try harder and look deeper. As for me, I recommend visiting the People's Republic of Interactive Fiction at pr-if.org. This Boston-based group's homepage features a big red play button, leading to a short list of IF classics, both old and new. 
which you can play for free right in your web browser. It also hosts that quick reference card I mentioned earlier. Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Game Shelf. To see more videos like this one or to read our blog, please visit us online at gameshelf.jmac.org. See you next time and happy adventuring!